Okay, this is the first tutorial in a short series I'm doing called Three Easy Jazzy Pieces. In each tutorial, we're gonna take a look at a short scored piano piece that I've written in a straightforward jazz style. Now you're gonna find these tutorials useful if you're looking to improve your general piano skills and your music reading ability. You know, maybe you've been through my Piano for Beginners course and you wanna kind of keep stretching yourself. If that's the case, then you're definitely in the right place. Or maybe you just wanna understand some of the rhythmic and keyboard techniques associated with jazz and blues piano. Now, if you've worked through my beginners series, you're going to find the format of this tutorial very familiar. There's a PDF score for you to download, and you can find that if you just look in the description text right underneath this video. You'll find a link to the PDFs down there. What I'm going to do is play through the piece once with the score on screen, and then once so that you can see my hands. And afterwards, I'll dissect some of the stuff that's going on musically and talk about some of the features of the score and give you some hints and tips on practicing. So in this first tutorial, the piece is called A Quiet Night on South Street. First of all, let's hear it with the score on screen. Okay, now let's take the score down so you can see my hands. So let's take a look at what's going on in this score. First of all, right at the top, we have the tempo marking and Dante, which a lot of people interpret to mean slowly, and it doesn't mean slowly at all. Uh, the best translation of Andante is at a walking pace. Okay, I usually take it at between, you know, kind of 80 or 90 beats a minute, something like that. Uh, a little bit faster, a little bit slower, but certainly don't hang about with Andante. Okay, it doesn't mean slowly. Then after the tempo, we have this instruction, which is really important for the whole piece, with a moderate swing. Yeah, this is jazz we're playing, or blues, It's kind of it kind of sits on the boundary between jazz and blues, this piece. Um, notation, musical notation as we have it, as it has come down to us, is not very good at notating the kind of swung rhythms, the long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, that you get in jazz and blues. And, and people find various kind of solutions to that problem, some of them less clever than others. A really crude one is just on the the quavers, the eighth notes, where you come across swing 
uh, most obviously. A, a really crude solution is to make each quaver pair a dotted note followed by a semiquaver. So dotted quaver, semiquaver, dotted eighth note, sixteenth note, um, which doesn't really represent swing very well at all. Okay. Uh, another thing you sometimes see is a metrical modification at the top. You know, stuff like uh, two quavers equals a crotchet and a quaver tripleted or something like that. I, I think that's a bit unnecessarily complicated and a bit constraining. So what I usually do is just say at the top, play this with a moderate swing or however much of a swing you want and kind of trust the uh, trust the player to understand that. If you don't really have a feel for swing yet, then listen to some jazz and blues and just get a sense of that dum da dum da long short, long short, which is um, most obvious, as I say, on quavers, um, on, on quaver pairs eighth note pairs but but kind of infuses the whole thing okay if you played this exactly as written without swing it would sound very different from what i just played in the um in the playthrough just there okay so just play tr try and get that moderate sense of swinging okay that jazzy feeling it that kind of gives you license to pull about the rhythm a little bit okay so because because we have a moderate swing there everything you're told rhythmically here should be seen as kind of an approximation Okay, you can use a bit of discretion to come and go with your swing to play around with the time a little bit, but but not not too much. You've still got that underlying pulse, that that straight four four underneath. Okay, so that is the the tempo and the swing. Let's look at the dynamics now. This piece I've deliberately written to be a test of your ability to play delicately and quietly. So most of the markings are. Uh, in fact, well, nearly all of them are MP, moderately soft. Okay, and we get down to PP, very soft, right at the end. And the occasional swell out and swell back using these hairpins, okay, but never getting really loud. The marking you might not recognize is this one, FP, Forte Piano. Um, and that literally means play a loud bit, then, but then soft again. And it, it was happening on these, this, this jumpy chord here, okay, which I'll come back to in a second. So loud, but then straight away soft again. And you're probably not going all the way back down to P, okay, you're probably going back down to MP, but it's a very particular and specific effect. And again, just listen to how I did it when I played through. It's loud, but then pulling straight back. Um, it's an effect more often associated with uh, brass instruments actually which do FP really really well really effectively but you often see it in piano scores as well so <clears throat> dynamically fairly straightforward but what we're looking for here is delicacy something that's really quiet it says so in the title a quiet night on south street okay so we're we'll after something delicate and quiet and under control okay okay um fingering you will notice that I've put quite extensive fingering in the right. Feel free to use different fingers. This is jazz, after all. They are merely suggestions. All, all fingerings are just suggestions. If you can find a better, more efficient way of doing it that fits your hand, then go for it straight away. There's nothing particularly unusual there. Um, you know, a bit of a bit of a jump there from the B flat to, to the B uh, natural, both on thumb, bit of a slide down, uh, but nothing. I think really difficult at all. Um, I've avoided putting too many fingering markings in the left hand. I've put some here, just to help you on that bass run up. But when it comes to these um, uh, these dyads here, uh, the, 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 these pairs of notes and the chords, I've kind of left it to you. Yeah. So by all means, copy the fingering that I used in the playthrough. But you will find that what is comfortable there kind of depends on your own hand. Okay, so they'll just have a play around with that. When I was playing through, I didn't use very much pedal. Um, I deliberately stayed off the pedal, apart from the places where I've specifically marked it. Okay, here, just to sustain those jumped grace notes. Okay, um, that's not to say that you can't use the pedal elsewhere if you want to use it for a little bit of an extra effect or to smooth out some runs. Uh, by all means, do it, but I was trying to stay off it. Yeah, I. I uh, one of the problems with pedal is that you it can kind of um, if you're after a kind of a kind of intimate feeling uh, as really you should be here it can kind of make a piece feel too big and then it can get a bit squishy and sloppy and everything so try to stay off the pedal except where I've marked it um, just to, just to mention these grace notes here there are various grace notes uh, throughout the piece but this one's an interesting one and, and the one that follows it down here um, Kind of how you do it is up to you. You can take it as fast or as slow as you like, really. 
the way I did it was to race up fairly quickly from the G up onto the main chord, okay? So I had the first beat starting on the grace note, okay? Sometimes when you see a grace note like this, it'll start on the beat before, but I think you should start grace note on the first beat, and then I was up onto the G and the D fairly quickly. You could hold it back a little bit longer than that in, into these notes if you wanted to. Just play around with that, see how it sounds on your piano. I think that's an important thing to do. Um, what else is going on? Nothing desperately difficult, one or two triplets. Oh yeah, quite a lot of rhythmic anticipation, okay? You will have noticed a few times, so here at the end of the second bar, the second measure, that E is being hit just before the chord that comes in underneath, yeah? Okay, so that's what we call rhythmic anticipation. It's very common in jazz and blues and indeed in pop and uh, genres like that. Um, remember that because we're swinging, that quaver is quite, that eighth note is going to be quite short. So it's only a very slight anticipation, a very slight anticipation ahead of the beat. Um, and and th those, those anticipated rhythms come up time and time again in this piece, okay? There are loads of them, yeah? If ever you're struggling with any of the rhythms, um, print out and, and draw lines down where the beats are. So one, two, three, four. I've tried to show the, the beats fairly, fairly clearly in the score, but you know, jazz rhythms are kind of a little bit difficult to, to pick out sometimes. Rather than copying exactly what I do, just do try and work it out for yourself there. Okay, so so watch out for those. Um, what else is there to say? Probably not a great deal. Written Uto, gradual slowing down at the end. You'll see what's happening here. I'm using the pedal here to hold that G and then just let those notes sing out. Don't worry about them fudging together because of the pedal, because they, they're, they're too high up really for that to, to happen. And af actually, that's kind of the effect that I'm after. And this spread uh, pair of notes here, Take, again, take it as fast or as slow as you like. You know, I again, I clink them kind of fairly close together, but you could spread them out a bit more. It depends how you handle the written you so the, the, the kind of slowing down. One thing I would say in general about um, tempo and pulse in this piece is that it might be a good idea to try it against a, a metronome. When I was recording, I did it against a click track, and it kind of helped because one of the problems with anticipation, um, and as I said, there's a lot in this piece, is that sometimes it, it can, um, if you've got anticipation in the piece, sometimes the actual anticipation can push you on too, too quickly. And also swing can lead you to anticipate things like this. So in, in, in a few places, I was just very, very slightly ahead of the beat when I have minims in the left here on, on the second minim, okay? Not enough to throw me out, but just slightly. And playing against a, tr a click track or a metronome is a handy way of getting to know the piece without practicing the kind of timing errors that you can come across if you start off without the metronome okay um so just a little tip there do try it with a metronome metronome apps are 10 a penny you know if you've got a get your smartphone go to google play go to the app store there are loads of metronome app, metronome apps for desktop as well you know they're, they're dead easy um I think I set my click track at 86 beats per minute. Yeah, so it's somewhere around there, whatever feels comfortable. Okay, and that is kind of it. The rest of it is all fairly standard kind of music reading. I don't think I've missed anything out. It's all quite straightforward. So your job now is to download the score using the link underneath this video on the YouTube watch page, print it off and have a go at it for yourself. As I did in the beginner's series, I've included both US letter and A4 sizes of the score. Yeah, so whatever kind of paper you happen to have loaded into your printer, you should be able to print a copy off. I should say, by the way, that um, printing off a copy, in, in fact, you know, always using paper music is a very, very good idea. I know a lot of people use iPads and even laptops in front of them on the keyboard, but if you've got a paper copy in front of you, it's so much easier to mark it up using a pencil. You know, you can write in fingerings and phrase marks and, and ticks and little smiley faces and all the rest of it. And it's it's just so much more instinctive and, and easy to do that if you've got paper and pencil. So do, do please print off. The first few times that you're going through it, just try to work it out from the score. Don't look back at my playing, 
to start with, yeah? Have a go at working it out from the score, that'll help you with your music reading skills, and then once you've got something going, just check back against what I was doing, you know, just to kind of measure your performance. If you manage to put together a really good version, maybe even better than mine, please do record it, video it, stick it on YouTube, I'll be really interested to see that. Okay, so there we go. I hope that was useful. There will be two more of these easy jazzy pieces coming up in the next few weeks. You know, kind of let me know what you think. And, um, you know, comment, subscribe to my channel, follow me on social media. Please do check out my Patreon crowdfunding campaign at www.patreon.com slash Bill Hilton. If you can fund me doing this stuff, that would be great. And also, as I always say, please do check out my books, especially How to Really Play the Piano, The Stuff Your Teacher Never Taught You, which is available both as a print and a PDF edition, and which, if you can read just a little bit of sheet music, you will find useful in helping you understand stuff like chords and improvisation and all the kind of stuff that I cover on this channel. Okay, there we go. I'll see you again very soon.